Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this last section of decision making uh, which would be the uh, last concept with that we will discuss in this course on introduction to cognitive psychology. In the previous lecture, we discussed complex thought process and under that we discussed two uh, basic phenomena in complex thought process namely reasoning and uh, judgment. Reasoning and judgment uh, when they finish up, they lead to the process of decision making and that is the topic that we will be discussing in today's lecture. So, uh, what this lecture will be comprised of is uh, decision making, what the term implies, what processes are involved in decision making, how it is done, what are the various models of decision making and at the end of it, uh, the various other cognitive processes which interact with decision making uh, to affect uh, idea or to, to give rise to a final choice. So, uh, before we go into the uh, uh, process of defining what is decision making, uh, let us first uh, revise a little bit on to uh, the topic of reasoning and judgment. So, the last class on uh, topics of reasoning and judgment, we thought uh, uh, and I, I showed to you how this is the last step in any cognitive process. So, uh, within this uh, whole uh, lecture series, we have been studying various cognitive processes starting from uh, perception, uh, pattern recognition in perception to attention, uh, then leading to the process of uh, memory and following by processes of language, uh, thinking and problem solving and then coming to the higher order cognitive process of reasoning, judgment and decision making. Now, what does decision making actually imply? Uh, uh, in the classes or in the lectures of uh, reasoning and decision making, we saw that reasoning is basically a phenomena which leads to uh, verification of uh, uh, facts based on current knowledge. So, basically uh, uh, when the uh, lower order cognitive processes uh, which are uh, basically perception, attention, memory and, uh, and, and these basic cognitive processes when they produce an input or when they produce a, uh, a kind of a, um, a knowledge or representation, a mental representation, these mental representations needs to be further analyzed and processed. And the further analysis and process of the mental representations is generally done by the process of thinking, reasoning, judgment and decision making. So, in, in reasoning what we tend to do is the mental representations, the solutions which have been generated uh, through or uh, the kind of uh, output that has been generated to the basic cognitive processes, uh, they are evaluated or they are considered in, in, in terms of the uh, present information, in terms of the given information at that point of time. So, basically reasoning is a process of uh, finding evidence uh, for the conclusions that are been generated or that have been that are uh, uh, generated uh, uh, for the con conclusions which have been drawn from the basic or the cognitive processes. Now, from reasoning we move into the or uh, the second process which is called judgment. So, basically in reasoning we define there are two kinds of reasoning, we have something called uh, syllogistic and conditional reasoning or uh, which is which are part of deductive reasoning and then we have inductive reasoning which has the uh, if or kind of a statement, two kinds of uh, reasonings are out there. Now, the reasoning process uh, basically uh, goes ahead and uh, finds out evidences or provides evidences of um, uh, to support the conclusions uh, which have been generated as an output. 
in judgment what we tend to do is uh, looking at uh, the conclusions we uh, go ahead and judge whether whatever the conclusions have been brought up in which of which of those conclusions are valid and which of those conclusions are not valid. So, let us say that the basic order cognitive processes gave us uh, a number of conclusions and through the process of reasoning we then go ahead and provide evidences for the existence of each of these uh, conclusions which have been derived. So, in a cognitive process or in a, in a uh, let us say in a cognitive pipeline to the process of perception, uh, attention uh, and memory we have generated an output. Now, this output or this kind of mental representation which has been generated from the basic level cognitive processes have to be uh, supported by uh, evidences and reasoning is a process uh, through which uh, we uh, go ahead and uh, provide the evidence of why these conclusions are valid and not. Judgment is a process through which we look at those uh, uh, conclusions which are valid and those conclusions which are not valid. And so, these are something which we have done in the previous classes. What is decision making? Decision making is a process which is a step ahead of judgment. In judgment, we look at a number of uh, uh, conclusions, we look at a number of uh, out outcomes from the basic level processes. In the process of decision making, we make a choice. So, out of the number of given available conclusions to us through judgment and reasoning, we then make a choice uh, according to our needs, according to our uh, requirements of which of the choices, which of the options or which of the conclusions which have been drawn from the basic level uh, cognitive processes should we go ahead and choose. And this choice process is actually a very, very uh, risky process. The reason being that once we make a choice, once a number of options are available to us we are, and we make a choice, there are always a chance that the choice will backfire. Meaning which that if there are four different options or four different conclusions which can be drawn from a particular uh, uh, mental representation or four different interpretations of a particular mental representation. Choosing one representation or uh, over the other basically puts up uh, puts us into a situation where if the choice that we are making is wrong, we could uh, have a wrong judge, uh, wrong uh, decision, and that could um, uh, uh, that could harm us in some way. So basically, decision making is then a very complex process. In decision making, what we need to do is we need to make choices. Also, another interesting thing that we should remember here is that when we are making choices in decision making, when we are uh, making decision choices most of the time that these choices have to be made in uncertainty or with certain amount of risk. Now, with the fact that human beings are not calculative machines and human beings do not have all the information available for making a choice a selection out of the number of options which have been given to us. So, we tend to make these selections which come out of judgment. Uh, the, through a process or through a, in a state of uncertainty, in a state of risk. And so, what we tend to do as humans is we tend to minimize this risk or uncertainty. We try to make decisions which do not backfire on us. So, let us then take a look at what is decision making and how do we go ahead and make decisions. Because these decisions are the ultimate or the final point of any cognitive process because these decisions finally decide how the goal that we have set, how do we attain a goal. So, basically then decision making is a process of making a choice, one of the alternatives which is been available from the process of judgment and this choice uh, has to be uh, made mostly in terms of or in, in situations where there is considerable amount of risk present and considerable amount of uncertainty presence. And for that we need to uh, understand how this decision process really works and the various models of decision making which are available. So, let us then start with a very basic model of decision making. How do people actually go ahead and decide? Let us take a very simple situation. For example, a situation could be in terms of identifying major course that you would like to take. When you enter a college, when 
people or when uh, when students freshmen enter a college the very basic question which is in front of them is to choose a major is to choose a stream of study and so how do people go ahead and make this choice of stream of study so basically what they do is they look at the number of courses which are available and they look at uh, the goals that they have what they want to want be, uh, want to become in their life and based on the goals that they have based on their personal values based on the number of courses which are available and based on so many other uh, variables they make a final choice and this choice once made cannot be reversed that has to be understood that once you have selected a particular kind of major so what are the uh, what is the flow chart or how does a decision actually made or how is a decision actually made so this is a, a simple decision making flow chart which explains how decisions really work so first the first thing is to uh, in in any decision making process the first step is to set a goal first of all in making a decision in in making decisions among choices you people have to set some kind of a goal so let's take this example of choosing a major or choosing a particular branch of study and then evaluate this particular flow chart so let's say that somebody x enters a college as a freshman and then he has to make a choice of which uh, particular subject to take or which particular subject to choose for that process first he has to set a goal this goal is to to the first step in decision making is setting a goal so the person who is making a choice has to first set a goal of what he wants to become and this is the first step so let's say that somebody wants to become a doctor he or she will not opt into course which has mathematics and physics onto it and will opt into courses which are closer to medical sciences and closer to biology and those kind of courses. So, first in decision making process if you want to become a doctor or if somebody wants to has a goal of becoming a doctor entering a medical field or doing work with primates or an animal. So, in, in that case he has to choose that kind of a set that goal first. Now, once that goal is set once once somebody sets that goal he has to then make plans and gather information this is the second step. So, before so taking up a major or before taking up a stream of study first step is setting a goal and somebody have once they have set up a goal that they want to be in a medical field that they want to do uh, work on people they now have to make plans the making plan step basically evaluates of what has to be done what are the requirements of this kind of a uh, study in a medical field. So, you have to then make plans of what is to be done and what is not to be done in terms of making plan is which universities to select which universities are offering uh, this kind of courses is which are uh, what is the uh, rating of these universities which is the best kind of a rating within the medical field which branch that you want to select and so on and so forth that kind of planning has to be done. For this planning to be uh, efficient or for this planning to proceed you have to go through a step which is called gathering information and so within this step what people tend to do is to look at a number of universities which are available which offer these courses in medical. So, uh, and n number of universities are there what kind of courses that they offer what kind of specializations are there who is a good teacher what is the ranking of the university and all those kinds of information has to be gathered and with this information has then has to be started along several dimensions or several requirements which people might prefer based on their values based on their likeness. For example, one of the things that people could decide is I want to be a doctor, but I do not want to supposedly say practice dentistry and so I want to work with uh, basic anatomy or I want to work with dermatology. In these cases they have to select a university of that requirement or somebody would say that uh, I would I would not like to work too hard. So, I will take a medical university and so they would not be uh, going for top class institutions and going for secondary institutions and so on and so forth other people would like to specialize in certain areas and so they would uh, have to select uh, hospitals or institutes which specialize for example if somebody wants to work on to brain in india they would like to go to nbrc and so this kind of a thing has to be there so then you have to collect a number of institutions which work on to brain and you know come to know that in india there are three or four institutions which offer you uh, medical degrees or medical specializations in brain and so you have to apply to that and that is the process which is there so th first in any decision making process the first step has to be setting up a goal. Once the goal has been set we gather information or people gather information and then make plans according to this information and this process of 
setting the goal, gathering information and making plan is cyclic in nature. In the sense that as more and more information comes to you, your plans keep on changing and so does the goal keep on shifting. And so, this has to be done until and unless people attain a certain level of certainty that this is what I want to do and they get satisfied with the incoming information or the information that they are fetching. Once they have decided to go to a particular institute and be in a particular kind of uh, uh, select a particular kind of major for uh, their uh, graduation degree, they have to then structure their decision. The structuring of decision basically requires you to follow what path do you have to follow to carry out this decision. For example, in structuring decisions in terms of choosing a major is basically understanding how do you go enroll, what are the kind of activities that you are going to do there and what are the kind of tests that you are going to do afterwards and then which is the kind of practice that you want to do. And so, this is structuring the decision, how are you going to uh, take up this decision, how you are going to basically uh, carry on with this decision and then based on this structuring of decisions, looking at all the finer points, looking at all the pluses and minuses from all the institutes of your choice or all the institutes of your liking uh, taking all the uh, benefits of one institute and uh, uh, the non benefits of that institute and comparing it with benefits and non benefits of all available institutes of your liking you then go ahead and make a final selection. So, basically this is how the decision making process really works. So, this is how the flow chart of a decision making process is. It starts up with setting up a goal then fetching more information up related to the goal and then making plans of how effective this information is or making up plans of how to go about and attain this goal. Once that is done, we need to structure our decision which basically means that we need to recalculate the pluses and minuses of all the options which have been available. So, all the things which are coming out of reasoning and judgment, all the conclusions which are coming out of reasoning and judgment, we need to go ahead and balance them on some, some way and then make a final choice and make a final selection. And so, this is the final step which is generally in decision making. So, although all of these steps are required in decision making, but this is where the final step of decision making is all about. So, what is then how do we proceed with decision making? So, as we studied in the section on reasoning and decision making that judgment, the process of judgment which comes before decision making it suffers from a lot of errors. For example, the three most uh, errors which affect the process of judgment is the error uh, of using heuris such as the availability heuris, the representative heuris and the anchoring and judgment heuris. Now, what are these? These are some kind of mental shortcuts, these are some kind of shortcuts which people use for making judgment. Now, since all information is not available to people at all point of time, people use this kind of uh, heuris. In terms of the availability heuris, people trust on their memory. So, based on their memory, whatever comes first to their memory, people uh, make conclusions or people make judgment based on that. For example, the fact that if I ask people or if I ask uh, anyone what is the most common name in India, people will come up with which word uh, for example, uh, is, is the most common name or represents the most common name in India. People will come with the uh, idea that it is S or R. This comes from the fact that the dictionary has more number of words under S and R and so this is called the availability heuris because this comes to uh, us or this comes to the person. If people look into their memory, these are the two letters which comes to the name. So, what people will tend to do is that they will tend to know or they will tend to recollect the name of all the people that they know. And since most people are from S and R, in, in somebody's uh, let us say in somebody's nearby area and so that is what they tend to do that it is basically SNR and so this is this is turning on or this is basically the use of availability heuris. In comparison to this or in contrast to this basically is the representative heuris which affects judgment and this uh, uh, heuris is basically the one in which people look at data and compare it with some representative sample. For example, if you see somebody who is 6 foot 
2 inches tall, 6 foot 3 inches tall. The first thing that comes to mind is he has to be a basketball player because he is tall and so most basketball players are tall and so this has to be a basketball player. And this is representative heuris because what we tend to do is we tend to t uh, use this basic shortcut of taking this tall person and matching him, him with everybody who is tall and this idea somewhere is inside our, in our head that everybody who is tall has to be there. And so, these are some of the kind of errors which are there. For example, there are other errors of miscalibration of confidence and uh, the errors of spotlight uh, effect and so, these are the errors in judgment. Now, despite these errors which are coming from judgment that occur when we make a judgment, these judgments form an important part of the database for the process of decision making. Judgments are very important. Although judgment can be rooted or judgments has afflictions or judgment can be affected by a number of errors, but judgments are important to us. Why? Because they form the very basic data or they provide the very basic data for decision making. Now, decision making includes generally a choice between alternatives as I said. Now, the process of judgment gives us a number of alternatives, gives us a number of conclusions which are there, gives us a number of options which are there. What decision making does is to make a final choice or to make a final liking for a particular choice. Now, with the increase in the number of alternatives, now there is another problem. As the number of alternatives increase, as the number of options increase, the probability or chance of alternatives being wrong also increases leading to the increased risk or uncertainty of the choice. What does this really mean? It means that if a number of alternatives are available, we have to do a number of comparisons. And so, if let us say if a process of judgment leads to uh, many number of alternatives, then the chances of the alternatives number of alternatives being wrong also becomes more and more or the probability of those alternatives becomes more and more. And this uh, chance or this probability that a particular that some of these alternatives are wrong will lead to increase in the risk and uncertainty. Let us say that a process results in only two options. Now, if there are two options the chances of some uh, one of this option being wrong is half and so the chances of the other option being right is always half. Now, if we increase this to uh, 4 the chances of a particular option being right becomes 1 by 4 and uh, the it being wrong becomes 3 by 4 and similarly if we keep on increasing the number of alternatives the chances of an option being wrong increases and this increases the risk and uncertainty. As number of options increases the uncertainty and risk also of, uh, increases. Try to understand this in the present consumer society. With only a few choices available a few brands available for us to pick up we are very sure of what to buy and what not to buy. Let us look at phenyl brands, the number of uh, brands of phenyl which are available. Now, since there are only couple of brands of phenyl which are available and so we do not have to be very certain, we do not have to be very choosy and so these kind of um, uh, products are called low involvement products and people do not have to do, uh, go ahead and get themselves involved and the choice is very easy. But look at beauty products. Now, in beauty products there are a number of choices which are available and every day there is a new choice which is out there. And so, as a new as new and newer choices gets gets increased into or newer and newer choices gets included into what really happens is that the chances of failure also increases because people are not very certain the risk increases as people have not seen a new product or not tested a new product the chances that it will fail also increases and so this increases the risk or this increases the uncertainty. Now, there is something called the threshold approach of choice. Thing to be remembered is that as the number of choices increases, as the number of alternatives increases, the risk of or, or risk and uncertainty of failure also increases or the risk of uncertainty in making decisions also increases. Now, there is threshold theory of choice which were proposed by someone called Clemens and what it says is if a decision depends on the likelihood of an event happening, the attractiveness of the option should increase as the probability of the other event increases. So, what, what it really means is that if a particular event of a particular uh, decision depends on uh, an, an event another event happening and if the second event becomes more and more sure then people will choose that option. Let us take a shopping experience. Let us say that somebody wants to buy something and this buying of this product depends on uh, let us say whether uh, a kind of rebate is given onto it. 
And so, as you become more and more sure that so you buying a product depends upon whether something is given free with it or not. So, as uh, you are promised more and more that things are becoming free or things are being given free uh, for you to buy that particular product as the people advertise as the advertiser makes more sure that you get free things out of it your uh, choice or your likingness or your probability of buying the particular product A also goes on increasing. So, what it basically says is that if an event uh, is there if a particular buying of a product is dependent on some other e event uh, which could be whether something is offered with it or not and as uh, the conformity or as uh, it becomes more certain that when you buy a product A, a product B which you think comes free with it, that certainty of it becomes more and more, you will buy product A and not buy product B because product A is offering something which is free and so the more certain you are that it is being uh, offered free, the more chances that you will buy product A instead of B. Let us look at this in this way. So, let us say that there are two products A and B and these products have some associate product C. Right. It could be uh, that you are buying a washing machine and this washing machine has an additional accessory which is C which is required for and so product A is uh, product both product A and B require this accessory C. Now, product A announces that C comes free with A this accessory C comes free with this washing machine the C could be a dish loader or any and any other thing which is there. Now, the more certain or the more confirm that the, the manufacturer of A becomes with the fact that they are providing C free product A will be chosen more over product B because P or product B is not offering C. So, if an event of if you buying a uh, washing machine depends on whether C comes free with it, uh, it or not and as C becomes more and more certain you uh, start buying product A more and more and that is what is called the threshold choice of or threshold approach to choice. So, basically it is stated as is a likelihood that another event uh, happening that the attractiveness of an option should increase as the probability of other event also increases. Now, once that probability reach, reaches a minimum level of certainty, the alternative will be chosen and this is called the threshold approach of choice. So, as producers of product A confirm that they are going to give C for free, you choose product A. So, till the point of time that A and B both say that they are going to offer C, but you do not have an idea or you do not have any confirmed news, you have both these options of buying A and B washing machines. But the moment that uh, manufacturer of A says that it is certain it is uh, a minimum level of certainty is provided or given the fact that they say that uh, some charge some minimum charges will be incurred from you and then C will be given to you for a very, very minimum value, but B does not say anything about the accessory C the product manufacturer of product B does not say anything about the, uh, the, the buying of product C you will buy A because A is now saying that some amount of money will be taken from you a minimum amount and C will be given and so this is certainly and so you will choose this particular thing and this is called the threshold choices of decision making. Now, decisions which involve overconfidence and judgment attain a minimum level of certainty too easily leading to choices of wrong or unrewarding choices. Now, what does it really mean? Now, when once uh, we become overconfident with a particular judgment. Once we display some kind of overconfidence, we increase or we get in uh, the minimum level of certainty is reached at a very early stage. And so, at this point of time, the wrong or uh, unrewarding choices is can come over. Now, uh, go going back to this incident in which A and B are two washing machines companies which are offering washing machine and C is an accessory. Let us say that I trust A so much and the, the fact that since A is a company which has always been offering something for minimum rates or been giving uh, things for free and so with this trust I have an overconfidence that A is going to launch a machine with manufacturer of product A is going to launch this machine and I am confident I am more confident with the fact that it is going to give free because previous decisions or previous buying of this product shows that this particular manufacturer gives things for free. I am then leading to something called overconfidence and this will lead to wrong 
choices because it may so happen that although you get C for free, but A may not be very good. And so, overconfidence actually uh, leads to uh, attaining of or selecting of wrong choices. So, if people are overconfident in making a choice, if people ignore certain facts and becomes uh, show overconfidences in, in accepting a number of choices out of judgment, they turn on or they basically invite something called faulty choices. Now, basic question which comes with it is that is there a minimum level of certainty which varies with culture. So, is it true that certain cultures are uh, overconfident than certain other cultures and so there, there was a study done by Yates Lee and uh, Shimoto Suka in 1996 where the Asian culture and the, uh, and the, uh, and the western culture was compared. And so, in this study what really happened is the overconfidence effect was tested in uh, people from US and Taiwan. And so, a situation was given to people from both these uh, uh, situations or both, both these uh, countries in which uh, they were told or they were given this profile that a particular uh, two medicines have been invented for a particular kind of two different kinds of diseases which are there. And so, this, since these two diseases are very similar in nature, very similar in, in, in symptoms, these are the two different kinds of medicine that they work on to it. And then they were asked to give this medicine or basically provide these medicines for these two kinds of diseases. So, basically two different kind of diseases or two kind of diseases were thrown in which had similar symptoms and two kind of medicines uh, were uh, prescribed for or two kinds of medicines were given or were suggested for these two kinds of diseases. And then it was uh, people from both these cultures were asked to go ahead and diagnose what is the uh, looking at a profile of a patient and so several profiles were given to uh, the evaluators from both the countries and they were then asked to basically then diagnose the kind of uh, disease that they have and then give the medicine. This is the kind of setup which was there and so people from both Taiwan and US actually went ahead and did that. What really happened? What was the result of an experiment like this? It was found out that in general people were more confident and in the sense that people showed overconfidence in terms of uh, assigning a particular disease to a particular symptom. So, a particular disease or assigning a particular medicine to a particular disease. So, they were overconfident in that. But in general the results showed that people from Taiwan were more overconfident and made more number of errors in terms of assigning the wrong medicine to the wrong kind of disease. Now, remember initially I said that what happened here was that the two diseases had similar symptoms and so two different medicines were given to two different kind of uh, diseases. But then people from Taiwan may, were more overconfident and made more errors than people from the uh, western culture of the United States. Now, why could this be? what is the reason for this kind of a overconfidence and this kind of a more error proneness. And so, one of the reasons for this was provided the fact that people from Asian culture, from uh, Taiwanese culture, they depended more on their memory and so, they searched more of their memory and used more of their memory in terms of uh, finding out the symptoms or assigning the symptoms. Whereas, people from the western cultures, they referred to written manuals and so, they were more correct. Whereas, people from the uh, Asian cultures, they, uh, they depended more on their memory of what they have learnt and assigning a medicine. And so, one of the reason is this has to be uh, one of the reasons which was provided was this kind of a dependence on memory versus dependent on written literature or written uh, directives and following these directives which is the result for minimal level of certainties with various cultures. Now, decision making in decision making there are several models which have been used and so one of the there are two different kinds of models which have been used in decision making one is called the normative model and the other is called the descriptive model. So, in the normative model as we saw in, in the chapter on uh, or in the section on reasoning we saw there are two different models of reasoning also one is called the normative models and the other is called the descriptive models. The normative models are the models which are ideal which are uh, the ones which should be followed and these are rational models. So, normative models are those models which actually uh, should be followed in a situation or those models which have been prescribed or those models which are prescribed for any kind of um, uh, investigation or any kind of use and descriptive models are those models which 
actually are not ideal models, but which make a goal attainment easy. And so, these are the models which people actually follow. So, let us say if there are uh, if, if there is a problem which needs to be solved, there it, it can be solved in two ways. One is using analogy or one is using algorithmic approach and so in algorithmic approach using the algorithm is basically a normative model, because here everything will go in algorithm fashion and a result is expected out of it. Whereas, in the descriptive model people use heuristic approaches, people use heuristics to apply or to come up with a solution. And so, they, they do not follow these ideal solutions or uh, they use some kind of a rules of uh, thumb to arrive at a solution. And so, these are the two different kinds of models. And so, one of this normative models of decision making is called the expected utility model or uh, the uh, EU model to be brief. Now, what is this model? This is a model which have been borrowed from economics. So, economics are interested in the factors involved in choice and what is the type of model which describe a rational choice and behavior. So, but basically in an expected utility model the idea is that how do economists want to know what are the factors with which makes people choose between alternatives. So, given the fact that you have a number of alternatives which comes out of judgment, how do you go ahead and make a choice. And once you make a choice, what is the model which describes a rational choice. Now, what is a rational choice? A rational choice is a choice which provides you the better good which basically means that rational choice is that choice which provides which leads you to goal attainment with minimum of losses. And so, a rational choice is that choice which has which maximizes gains and minimizes loss. So, maximizes gains in the sense that you get more gain of, out of it, but even if you do not gain then you do not lose too much. So, a, a, a rational choice is a choice which maximizes which tends to maximize gains and minimize loss a situation like this. Now, one of the well established theories of decision making is something called the expected utility theory which comes from economics. And what is this theory? So, the theory states that when faced with some type of a uncertain choice when because in decision making it is always uncertainty because we do not have enough of information available to us. So, we make decisions under uncertainty and risk. So, the fact that when people make decisions under uncertainty we make our decision based on two factors. Generally, when we make decisions and when this decision is under uncertainty when we once we do not know all the information which is available, uh, we do not know all the facts which are available to us, we tend to make uh, decisions uh, with two factors with two different uh, under two different factors. One is the expected utility of the outcome. So, any decision which is rational according to the expected utility choice or expected utility theory is to be made in terms of the how much the expected utility of the of, of each outcome is. Now, we will define utility in a, in a while. So, the one, one factor which defines a rational choice, a choice which gives maximizes gain and minimizes loss is the one which provides the expected which provides the maximum utility and the second is what is the respective probability. So, the probability of the outcome versus uh, in multiplied by the expected utility the outcome will define a rational choice. So, basically expected utility theory says the expected utility is equ equivalent to the utility of the outcome into the probability of all outcomes. And so, this has been done. So, I have done for the ith outcome, it can be for n number of outcomes. And so, if there are three outcomes, let us say i, j and k, we find out the expected utility for ith item, for jth item and for kth item. And based on this, we then go ahead and tend to make the choice in which we have the maximum utility and the highest probability of the outcome being offered. Now, utility refers to whatever end what is utility, how do we define utility. So, utility refers to whatever end a person would like to achieve, it is basically what do you want to get out of a particular decision, it is that particular thing that you want to add, get at the end of a decision, be it, it could be happiness, it could be money, it could be something else satisfaction or whatever it is. Now, Broome 1991, they suggest that utility refers to the amount of good that comes out of a decision. So, basically once we make a decision, what is the benefit that we are getting out of it, what is the good that we are getting out of it. So, utility is basically defined in terms of the greater good which comes out of making a decision. 
Now, thus while making a decision we weigh the good that might come out with each alternative against the cost of that alternative. So, when we make a particular kind of a utility assessment of a particular outcome we look at what is the good that comes out of it and what is the payment that we are making, what is the sacrifice that we are making to get a particular good uh, uh, that uh, what is the particular kind of a sacrifice that we are making in uh, acquiring or in selecting a particular alternative and what is this alt once selected what is the good that this alternative is going to provide to us. We also access the probability of each of the alternative occurring. We also look at where, where if there are four alternatives, what is the probability of an alternative happening. Let us say that if uh, there are four alternatives, one alternative has a probability of happening which is 0 0.8 80 percent of the times and one alternative has the or the probability of happening which is only 1 percent time. Now, the fact that if there is the, uh, the alternative which has or the probability of occurring upon this only 1 percent that should not be chosen because it will never occur or it will never be available and so we, we should not select that thing and so that particular alternative. So, not only the utility say if, if, if an outcome presents uh, or if an outcome gives you greater utility if it is very good for you, but then the chances of this thing particular happening is very less we should not take that uh, outcome. We should take only that outcome which provides you utility in association or in addition to its uh, probability also a probability of occurrence also which means that the availability of it. So, if a particular choice is available is uh, vastly available and it provides even if less uh, good than some, some other alternative which has a very less probability of occurring we should choose that and that is called the rational decision making. So, whether alternatives provide the best combination of good and the likelihood will be chosen. For example, let us consider this example. Let us look at, look at these two options which are there. Now, if you flip a coin it turns up head and you get 40 dollars. Now, if you roll a dice it comes up 4 you get a 50 dollar. Now, which is the choice that you are going to make? If you look at the expected utility, if you look at through the uh, lens of expected utility, here you are getting a more higher dollar amount than in this case, but then people generally go ahead and take this. See the utility is 40 here, the utility is 50 here, but the probability of if you, cal if you calculate the expected utility, the uh, value is 40 here, right. And the probability of getting a head is half whereas, the probability of getting a 4 is 1 by 6. And so, in this case if you look into if you calculate the expected utility of the second is less or the expected good that is go going to get the appropriateness of this is lesser than this because the probability of 4 is 1 by 6 a probability getting a 4 in a throw of dice because there are 6 faces of a dice and getting a 4 is 1 by 6. And so, in this case this is more lucrative than this although this is a lesser dollar amount. Now, which options would you choose and definitely the option that you are going to choose is the one which is the first one and so this is the expected utility theory. Now, generally speaking this is a mechanical theory, it is an economic theory or mechanical theory of choice behavior or decision making. And so, generally speaking how people make decision is they violate this expected utility and the violation comes in terms of invariances of choices. Let us look at what is invariances of choices. Now, one of the normative predictions that need to be expected from the utility theory is that our choice should be invariant. Now, one of the predictions which comes from this expected utility theory is the fact that the choice that we make for a particular option should be invariant which means that if we, want, if we choose A as under situation 1 then we should stick with our choice in si under situation 2, but that is not what happens. Let us say that there are two in the previous case only given the fact that you choose the first one or the second one of the choices you take the choice of rolling a dice and flipping a coin and you choose the 50 dollar option given the fact that if situation changes. How does the situation change? The fact that it is uh, the fact this becomes an even number. If some situation changes in the fact that you know that the dice is biased in such a way that it will always fall towards even numbers. Now, if this situation ch changes even then you should consider or you should go with this dice or the fact that you come to know that the coin that is being flipped is somehow biased is in the it will always in it will give more number of heads than tails then you should not be varying your choices and the why is this kind of a thing there or why is this kind of a invariance 
invariance not being followed. Uh, the people do not follow this invariance or they change, change their outcome or they change their decision process and this is called the invariances or people show invariances of choices and this is one, one of the uh, violations of expected utility theory. What is it? That a decision maker's choice should not depend on the way a choice is presented. So, if a choice is presented in a negative frame or a positive frame, which means that if it is positively worded or negatively worded, people should not go ahead and make flip between their choices. If you make a particular choice, if you have considered all the information and if you make a particular kind of a choice, you should not be going ahead and flipping between choices. That should be one other thing. So, example, if I prefer choice A over choice B in situation 1, then I should prefer for choice A over choice B in situation number 14 as long as A and B are identical in two situations. So, if situation changes, if some other things in the external environment changes, people should not be uh, changing their choices, but this is what does not happen and this is called preference reversal or invariances of choices. Now, people often switch their preferences from one outcome to another as situation changes, people go on changing their choices. And so, this is one of the problems with the following up of the expected utility theorem. In the expected utility theorem, the fact is that given the fact that a particular option is shows particular kind of utility to you, it is highly utilized good providing you higher good and it the probability of it occurring is also the same. If situation changes, you should not be changing your options, but people do change. So, people often change their preferences of one outcome over another based on how these outcomes are presented demonstrating irrational, irrationality and this is basically what is called irrationality. This is what people show in terms of irrationality. Now, consider the preference reversal which is shown. So, uh, Lichtenstein and Slovak 1971, they showed something called a preference reversal and they showed this violation of expected utility through a, uh, through a phenomena which is called preference reversal. Now, the general procedure involved having subjects look at two different gambles and decide one which gamble they would like to play and number two how much the gamble was worth. So, given the fact that people were given six different choices and so in each choices I will show you the choice which has been given to that. There are six different choices to people and uh, each each one of has a winning percentage. So, there is there is a probability of this gamble happening and then there is a utility of it happening and but the situation changes. So, understand that each of these choices have a particular utility and a particular probability. Now, the fact is two different options or two different uh, things are there. In one case, you are the one who is playing this gamble or who is playing this kind of a game and the other case, you are the one who is owning the gamble and you want to sell this gamble or you want to other people to gamble on this. In which in, in the first case, which gamble are you going to choose? In the second case, which gamble are you going to choose? Let me give you one minute time to basically go ahead and make your choice. If you are the one who is playing which gamble or which of these choices are that, that you are going to basically accept or which are the these choices are the, are the one which you are going to play. But if you are the one who is the owner of this gamble and want other people to invest in this, which is the choice that you are going to choose. Now, as you would understand that if you are the one who is going to play, most people choose this gamble because there is a 99 percent chances of probability of winning. So, you would win only 4 dollars, but the chances of winning is high, higher. So, if the chances of winning are higher, people actually uh, when they play a gamble, this is what they bet into. But if you are the one who hold this gamble, if you want other people to, to basically go ahead and put a knee or play your gamble, we will look into something like this, in which case 33 3 percent that you win 16 dollars. So, you will now look at the higher amount of money right. So, you, it is the money value in which. So, you put more money onto a higher gamble and so the very fact as, as it appears to be the fact that people should be choosing this in both the cases that is not how it is. One use, once you own the gamble, you would want other people to get attracted by the money value, but the fact that it, uh, the higher money value has a lower probability of winning is the one gamble that you will choose, but when you are playing it, you will play that gamble which has higher certainty, but lower gambling money. 
So, this is how preference reversal happens. So, when, once I am playing I will always look at a gamble which has higher certainty of being uh, played or higher certainty of giving me even if it is giving me lower values. But when I am selling a gamble I will always think of a gamble in which higher value money is there, but the chances of winning it are very less and that is what we need to do. And so, in this in, in this case I will this will be the particular gamble where I will own. So, while owning I will own this, but while playing I will play this and so this is called preference reversal. Now, Lichtenstein in Slovak expected the choice of which gamble to play would be influenced by the probability of winning whereas, the choice of selling price for the gamble would depend on the partial dollar amount to be won. So, if you are looking at the amount of dollar that is to be won that uh, uh, is the decision factor in selling a gamble, but when you are playing the gamble it is the probability of winning which decides you how or why you are going to uh, play a particular gamble. Now, why is this preference reversal irrational? What is the reason for the irration irrationality? The preference reversal phenomena demonstrates the inadequacy of expected utility as a descriptive model of decision making. The utility model fails to provide a good description of how we make choices. The utility model does not reflect how humans actually go ahead and make choices. The utility model is very good in terms of economic factors, in terms of prices, in terms of other non-living entity, but when can when it comes to humans it is very difficult to understand how people make choices. Now, in many circumstances because assumes as much human rarely have the in, uh, because it assumes as much. Now, the expected utility theorem it, uh, understands or it, it assumes that humans have all the information necessary for making a choice, but it is to be noted that humans do not have all the information which is available or with uh, humans do not have all the information available for making a choice at any point of time. So, humans rarely have all the available ne uh, information necessary to make a decision. Even if they did, they do not have, they lack the ability to combine and weigh all the information accurately. And so, this is one of the reason or this is one of the factor in which or this is one of the uh, reason why there is this preference reversal. So, in terms of machines, in terms of economics, in terms of prices, the expected utility theorem is the one which fits, but with humans it does not fit in the sense that uh, humans do not first of all have all the information for making the choices and so uh, most of the times they are irrational in making the choices or they show irrationality. And the other reason is even if they have all the information uh, uh, possible they are not able to combine all the information to make the right kind of a choice because this computation this calculation requires a lot of other factors to be there. And so, this is the reason why people do this preference reversal or switch choices. Now, in addition to the expected utility theory, there is something called the multi attribute utility theory and the what is the multi attribute utility theory? It is an extension of the expected utility theory. Now, what if choices differ on many dimensions? Now, given the fact that in expected utility theory, there was just one dimension on which the choice was varying. Now, if the choice is varying on number of dimensions or number of variables, we use something called the multi utility theory or a multi attribute utility theory. Example, choosing a major in college. Now, if you are choosing a major in college, it is not the goal of becoming a doctor that is making you take a medical field. There could be several other things for example, how close is the campus from your home, how pleasing is the campus and there are so many other variables which lets you decide a particular college, a particular medical college to go to. And so, once we are doing that, there are multi attributes or multiple dimensions on which the final decision is dependent. So, major differences in many ways as you are interested in them, your job market after graduation, the faculty etcetera and so, number of variables will actually go ahead and decide not just one goal goal of becoming a doctor. Then how should one make the choice? First of all in multi attribute utility theory as against the expected utility theory where there is one choice and one utility there. If there are multiple utilities and multiple probabilities based on in people need to first break decision down into important dimensions. We have to understand those dimensions which are important to us and those dimensions which are not important has to be thrown out or given lower weightages. Determine the relative weights importance of each dimension. Each dimension which is there for example, one of the dimension that people uh, are, for example, for me one of the dimensions of choosing college was how near it is to my hometown and that was one of the highest and I gave it the highest weight. And so, other things got lower weight. Weight is basically how much 
preferable that dimension or that particular attribute is to me and so we give this kind of a weights. Then we have to list all the alternatives of which are available with their weights. Run the rank the alternatives among each dimension which leads us to choosing the is a particular uh, scenario which I have created. So, then the, uh, the criteria on which you want to requirements, this is the important weight that you give to it and these are the majors that you would like. Each one of it has multiplied by the weight. This is the equal weighted criteria and this is the top be able to decide which college you would like to go and which college you would like to avoid. And so, this is the multi attribute theory uh, which is again a, a normative model of uh, decision making. Thank you.